Well, welcome everybody to the fifth uh, entry element of this SOFIE seminar series. I'm Andrew Patton, the organizer of the series, and today I'm very excited to present uh, Professor Ying Ying Lee from the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology as our speaker, and her discussant will be Professor Michael Wolf from the University of, of Zurich. The format for the meeting today, for the seminar today, will be the same as in previous weeks. We'll have 40 minutes for the speaker, 10 minutes for the discussant, and then 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Uh, if you would like to ask a question either during the seminar or at the end in the question and answer session, either use the Q&A box down at the bottom of your Zoom screen or use the raise your hand feature. And then uh, during the talk, there'll be a break to take some questions or afterwards and I'll unmute you and you can ask the, ask the speaker a question. Um, one last thing I wanted to note before we move on to the presentation today is that the SOFI seminar series is now open for submissions. Details on how to submit a paper for consideration in the series is on the conference webpage, which was at the, the link at the top of the slide I showed at the beginning here. Uh, the process is not very difficult. Details are, are in a paragraph on that webpage. Okay, so Ying Ying, if you would like to share your screen, we can, we can begin. Looks great. Oh, sorry about this. Um, I seem to freeze here. All right. Um, thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. This is, uh, this is really a great pleasure. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'm sorry, something wrong with my slides is keep jumping. This is not the page. Um, maybe I'd rather just uh, without full screen, is it okay? Yes, that, that looks good. Okay, sorry about this. All right, so today we're going to talk about estimating large efficient portfolios with heteroscedastic returns. This is joint work with Meng Meng Ao from uh, Xiamen University and uh, Xinhua Zheng from Hong Kong UST. Um, so here's an outline of my talk. So uh, we'll start with an introduction, um, basically uh, some background about the mean variance optimization, and then um, talk about the challenges of mean variance optimization, as well as um, some existing methods. So in particular, we're going to talk about this mixer, um, uh, which we uh, established in a previous paper. And then we're going to discuss potential directions to, um, to make further improvement so uh, we uh, introduce a new method, which is called Maxer H. So here the H stands for heteroscedasticity. So Maxer H can be applied to heteroscedastic returns, and uh, we are going to see some uh, theoretical properties for it, and as well as extensive numerical studies. And then we'll end with a brief summary. So uh, the uh, mean variance optimization, as we recall, uh, has two equivalent forms. One is maximizing portfolio return given risk constraint. Another is to minimize, equivalently, minimize portfolio risk given return constraints. So the solution to Markov risk optimization is called mean variance efficient. And it actually has such an explicit formula. So the um, the portfolio weights um, will be, uh, the optimal portfolio weights can be represented by the risk constraint sigma, uh, as well as the return vector and the covariance matrix. So if we use the theta to represent the quadratic form here, mu sigma inverse mu, um, then the uh, optimal um, portfolio weights can be represented in terms of theta as well. So theta here has an important meaning. It is the square of the maximum Sharpe ratio. This W star, D 
the optimal portfolio attains the maximum expected return, R star, um, and uh, which um, is given the risk constraint at the level sigma, little sigma, and also it attains the maximum sharp ratio, which is square root of theta. So, um, Markowitz mean variance optimization is definitely the, the cornerstone of modern portfolio theory. And it continues to be the, uh, the foundation of most of the, you know, the most frontier developments in asset allocation. So here I take two examples, um, two of the um, largest robo advisors, Betterment and Wealthfront, for example. So we see that their uh, portfolio allocation strategies are mostly based on, are mainly based on mean variance optimization. Um, uh, however, um, more than portfolio allocation um, actually faces some um, unique challenges. So this is, uh, I would say it's convoluted with big data challenges. So uh, in particular, we always have a large number of stocks available for investing. So uh, funding the optimal portfolio faces intrinsic challenges such as high dimensionality. So the, uh, the plugin portfolio, we are going to take this as an example just to illustrate the challenge due to high dimensionality. So uh, recall that the Markowitz optimization, uh, sorry, sorry, the optimal weights, W star, has such an explicit formula. Um, and then the mu is the mean vector and the covariance matrix sigma. Actually, they are unknown. So they have to be estimated in practice. So when we use the most natural or naive estimators, such as the sample mean and sample covariance matrix to plug in, um, then we call that portfolio plug-in portfolio, then we obtain such results. So this is, um, on this picture, we have risk and sharp ratio of 100 simulations. So we uh, simulated from the idealized Markowitz setting IID normal uh, random variables, um, well, uh, as the returns. And then uh, in this setting, we have a um, number of assets, which is roughly um, about a half of the number of, of, of observations. So we see that in this case, when we plot here 100 simulations, 100 portfolios um, from the plugin method, then we see that the risk can be much higher than the risk constraint that we set, which is in black solid line here. And then the risk of the plugin is black dotted lines. Uh, in this setting, uh, the risk seems to be roughly uh, almost twice as the risk constraint. And then uh, the high risk were, were not really compensated with high returns. So uh, meaning that if we look at the sharp ratios, Actually, the theoretical, because this is simulation, we know what is the optimal sharp ratio. So the theoretical optimal sharp ratio is, um, again, in black solid line here, but the plug-in portfolio can only reach maybe about half of that level. So this is definitely a worrisome situation. Um, such poor performance of plug-in portfolio has been documented in the literature. For example, for example Michel uh, has called this phenomenon the Markowitz optimization enigma, and uh, some other research has been done after that. So this situation worsens as the number of asset increases. Um, so the key reason turned out to be uh, this uh, result here, which we documented in uh, our earlier paper. Uh, this 2019 RBS paper. So uh, basically, this reason is really due to high dimensionality. When we have a large number of assets um, um, to handle, and compared with the sample size, if the number of assets n is not small compared with the number of observations t, suppose uh, this um, can be represented by a ratio eta, then actually the ratio of the plug-in of sharp ratio compared with the optimal sharp ratio will um, convert to such a number that's going to be smaller than one, strictly smaller than one. So uh, we see that eta is here, that's a non-trivial, that's positive. So this is strictly smaller than one. So that explains the poor performance of sharp rate of uh, uh, plug-in portfolio, why plug-in portfolio have a smaller sharp ratio than the optimal one. And then also uh, as 
the eta becomes larger, meaning that if we want to handle an even larger number of stocks, suppose the um, n over t relative to the number of stocks over uh, the number of observations becomes larger, then the performance of the um, plug-in portfolio will be even more poor. So we are going to see even more suboptimal performance. So this uh, result explains that, and indeed, well, there has been uh, quite a lot of uh, research um, done um, to you know deal with this situation. So there are two, there are two strengths, mainly two strengths of literature. One is to adjust the input. Another is to impose constraints on the portfolio directly. So adjusting inputs includes mean estimation and also um, adjusting the covariance matrix, including shrinkage methods by. Uh, um, our discussion today, um, um, Michael Wolf and then Lodoy and also uh, additional methods like uh, DCC uh, shrinkage and so on and so forth. And then uh, imposing uh, constraints on the portfolio directly includes, for example, no short sale constraints and also L1 constraints. Um, so basically the portfolio weights put in together um, uh, have to satisfy a gross exposure um, constraint which can be documented by our one norm. So, um, well, I, we take one of the latest and uh, competitive method, nonlinear shrinkage, as an example. Here, uh, if we add to the previous charts this um, um, red dotted lines to represent the nonlinear shrinkage method, then we see that basically the um, the performance can be much better than the plug-in portfolio. So in terms of risk, this is much closer to the risk constraint. However, we'll still uh, see a um, systematic violation, meaning that the risks of the um, um, nonlinear shrinkage method still will be higher than the risk constraint systematically. And then in terms of sharp ratio, again, substantial improvements However, um, there's still a distance to the optimal sharp ratio. So of course, uh, well, uh, this is theoretical optimal one. So everything can only approach it from below. So, um, well, there seems to be still uh, a big difference to the optimal um, uh, level. And then um, uh, probably a major breakthrough uh, was made in our previous paper, this so-called MAXA, uh, which stands for Maximum Sharp Ratio as Estimated and Sparse Regression Portfolio. So there we um, actually theoretically established a result uh, which shows that the MAXA will asymptotically uh, approach the, uh, the risk constraint as well as the sharp ratio optimal sharp ratio. So if we plot it into the previous picture, uh, we represent, uh, we use uh, blue dotted lines to represent the maxer, then we see that the risk, um, a risk constraint is well respected. And then on the other hand, in terms of sharp ratio, uh, indeed this becomes much closer to the optimal level. So again, this is the theoretical optimal upper bound. So all practical uh, portfolios can only approach it from below. So this is what Maxer can achieve for this finite sample. Um, uh, just to um, maybe uh, introduce some of the key elements of the Maxer. So the, the first uh, innovation there is uh, this unconstrained regression representation of the mean variance problem. So um, the original mean variance optimization, we have to um, you know, uh, satisfy such a constraint for the risk of the portfolio um, to be um, you know, constrained by this little sigma. And then uh, now we have this um, unconstrained regression representation, we show that this is actually equivalent to the constrained mean variance optimization. So uh, this regression actually is very special. So the left-hand side, um, but basically the response is actually a constant. So this constant depends on the optimal sharp ratio theta, as well as the optimal return that uh, one can, uh, optimal expected return given such risk level. Um, and uh, and then so uh, on the right hand uh, right hand side will be uh, our predictors will be the returns and then if we solve for it we get the portfolio weights. So um, in order. 
to uh, actually proceed such a regression. So this is an equivalent form of the Markowitz waste optimization. And then uh, we have to solve it to find the solutions. In order to proceed, then we have to first estimate the response. So the response we see here is actually um, Estimating the response amounts to estimating the optimal sharp ratio. Optimal sharp ratio will be square root of theta or equivalently square root of optimal sharp, sorry, square of optimal sharp ratio of theta. So um, that means actually as a middle step, we estimated the optimal sharp ratio of theta. And then, uh, well, uh, this is a high dimensional uh, regression problem. So in order to reach the desired consistency, then we have to use um, sparse regression such as lasso. So the uh, lasso um, here basically will be able to give us um, consistent results if we have the sparse structure. So um, it's going to give us a sparse portfolio. And then, so we develop this um, for two scenarios, with or without factor investing. So the case with factor investing is particularly interesting because once we have factors in the portfolio, then um, so basically we can see that um, individual assets, the kind of the contribution from individual assets or may, may not be so dense anymore. So basically there won't be so many individual assets that can still contribute. So that basically uh, gave a reason to believe that a sparse portfolio on top of uh, uh, actually an optimal portfolio based on factors uh, will perform very well. And indeed, we proved such a theoretical result, which says that the uh, max portfolio will asymptotically achieve the maximum expected return while meeting the risk constraint. So uh, in other words, this approaches the mean variance efficiency for large portfolios. So to the best of our knowledge, this is uh, the first theoretical guarantee uh, for such kind of efficiency for mean variance optimization. Uh, so indeed, so far this, is, uh, this has been exciting and basically we have such uh, convergence results. Um, is there, well, a natural question would be, is there any direction to improve even further? So, um, Oh, sorry, I, um, maybe I should pause here if there's any questions before we proceed. Uh, you've been extra clear today, Ying Ying. We don't have any questions at this point, but I'll That's keep great. back to the remainder. I'll proceed to the next, um, next H. So, um, well, a natural direction that we may think uh, of will be if we can make use of more data, that'd be great, right? So existing methods apply to monthly data, which can roughly be viewed as ID and normal that satisfies uh, a lot of the assumption from many of these methods. Um, when we aim to use data of higher frequency, then additional challenges arise. So uh, there's high vitalness, heteroscedasticity, uh, serial dependence, and so on and so forth. So it is important to build a method that applies to more general models of returns. So, um, well, to motivate a more general model of returns, we are going to, uh, I'm going to actually take a picture from a work in progress uh, by my student Ding Yi, um, Professor Zhao Bango, and uh, also my colleague Xinhua Zheng. So uh, what's plotted here are um, realized volatilities for three representative stocks. And they are, uh, well, one of them is mo relatively more volatile, one relatively less volatile, and one is kind of a medium of a medium level volatility. So we plot them together and we see that, first of all, there's definitely heteroscedasticity. So the uh, returns are, uh, well, the volatilities are, are time varying. And then uh, secondly, and very interestingly, we see co-movement feature in the stock volatilities. So motivated by uh, such phenomena, we model uh, the returns by um, the following, as the following. So the return of um, an individual assets follow a factor model where we have K factors, uh, the K is a finite number, and then uh, capital N uh, individual uh, assets, and then uh, the factors and individual, uh, well, idiosyncratic returns are modeled by um, these 
um, relationships. And here the gamma key models time varying volatility. It reflects co-movements in volatility and idiosyncratic volatility. So we have um, actually uh, here is some uh, evidence from uh, uh, the talk two weeks ago by Professor Engel. And then uh, also there's uh, additional evidence from um, uh, other research. So basically we uh, have this mixed, um, no, uh, well, mix, mixture of um, normal for the returns, uh, for the uh, factors, as well as idiosyncratic returns. Uh, so this model uh, poses challenges such as uh, dependence among returns and conditional heteroscedasticity and uh, heavy tailedness. And so uh, we aim to basically estimate this high dimensional optimal portfolio in the presence of such complexities. So, um, well, um, how to estimate such a portfolio? Uh, the starting point will be such a factor idiosyncratic portfolio separation. So uh, this is also a result established in the previous paper where we show that in fact a, portfolio, a full portfolio uh, will be, a, will be um, basically a combination of optimal portfolio of the factor um, and the optimal portfolio of the idiosyncratic returns. So, um, uh, and then uh, how much, well, here basically we use WF star to denote the optimal portfolio of factors and WU to denote the uh, optimal portfolio based on idiosyncratic returns. So uh, how much to allocate to each optimal portfolio, it turned out to be really natural. So the, um, uh, the weighting depend on kind of the contribution of each optimal portfolio to the um, full portfolio. So in terms of sharp ratio, so this is square root of optimal sharp ratio that can be um, contributed from the idiosyncratic returns. And this is optimal sharp ratio um, that we can obtain for the full portfolio. So this weighting, as soon as we know the thetas, then we, we can, um, we know how to separate this. Basically, uh, as soon as we have the optimal portfolio uh, based on factors and optimal portfolio based on idiosyncratic returns, and then if we know the contributions of the optimal sharp ratios of each component, then we know the full portfolio. So this is the starting point. And then uh, the main task here uh, to solve this, um, the complexities of uh, this um, heteroscedastic model, um, actually, um, well, from there, uh, actually this um, involves quite a lot of details. So due to time limitation, I will um, not cover all of the, the details, but rather go to such a summary page. And uh, basically I'm going to give in, um, explanations for each of the main steps. So the maxer H um, in fact contains the following uh, main steps. One, estimation of factor model coefficients with Huber regression. So here we see from the um, uh, factor idiosyncratic portfolio separation result that actually uh, one, uh, the, the key there is to estimate the optimal portfolio based on idiosyncratic returns. The reason is that the idiosyncratic returns are high dimensional. We have a lot of them, and there it, it, it's the more difficult part. The, uh, um, the optimal portfolio based on factors will be low dimensional. We can actually just use um, a Marco as, you know, just the traditional uh, formula, plug-in formula. We can have the optimal portfolio based on factors. So uh, when, we, when we aim to estimate the idiosyncratic uh, optimal portfolio, uh, we need to know the um, factor model coefficients for each stock, and we want to estimate the alphas and betas. Uh, however, under this general model, because the returns are actually heavy tailed, so um, ordinary least squares regression will not be sufficient. So we have to use robust estimation, such as uh, Huber regression. So in this paper, we use Huber regression. And then um, a second a uh, important step is to transform the heteroscedastic returns into homogenized approximate Gaussian returns. Because uh, in our, uh, we need, um, for example, a sparse portfolio like Lasso, but then in Lasso, we cannot deal with um, heavy tailed returns. Um, and then in order to, um, to uh, be able to use such sparse regression, we have to um, transform the 
the hydroscedastic returns. And then here it involves the estimation here. We actually already have a good estimation of the factor model coefficients, and then as well as some estimation of uh, you know the gamma the volatility. So here involves a consistent estimation of the gamma t's volatilities as well. Once we have those, then we can trans uh, transform the heteroscedastic returns into homogenized approximately Gaussian returns that we can use lasso. Next, consistent estimation of maximum sharp ratio using a random matrix theory for elliptical models. So actually, the estimation of maximum sharp ratio has been uh, always uh, well um, difficult indeed. But then uh, in the previous paper, if the returns are IID uh, normal, then we actually uh, indeed uh, this one has a formula that can estimate the maximum sharp ratio. Um, however, in this um, setting, in a more general model setting, in fact, the previous formula will be biased. So um, um, that's why, uh, well, indeed, uh, by a kind of extended result for uh, random matrix theory for elliptical models, we were able to con construct a consistent estimate for the maximum sharp ratio. And then, uh, well, with all of this getting ready, we, with the homogeneous returns, consistent response estimate, which is here the maximum expected, uh, maximum sharp ratio, uh, together with lasso, then we can have um, the estimated large portfolio uh, with, in fact, theoretically, with return and risk consistency. So to be more specific, we have such uh, asymptotic results. So the maxer H um, formed by these key steps will be able to, in fact, reach the um, risk constraint asymptotically. So asymptotically, the um, portfolio risk will be very close to the risk constraint sigma. And then also the um, expected return of it will be close to the optimal expected return. So that's the good news. And then uh, if we look at the assumptions here, the gamma t here is stationary with finite two plus delta moment. So here indeed, we require the moment condition that we require for the gamma t or for the returns will be two plus delta moment. We see that we don't even require um, finite, uh, you know, existence of ketosis. So we don't even require fourth moment. Uh, so this can deal with uh, very high detailed returns. Um, so um, basically, because of this, we see that Maxer H approaches mean variance efficiency for large portfolios under such heteroscedastic setting. All right. So, if no question, I will proceed to uh, simulation studies. Um, so we actually uh, conducted quite um, uh, a lot of um, extensive numerical studies. Um, so empirical studies would be more interesting, but then we can see from simulation studies some of the uh, performance, if we know, for example, the theoretical, um, the, the true parameter values, then we can calculate the, uh, the true risk and sharp ratios for comparison. So there's uh, some value to see this. So in the simulation, we see, uh, we simulated the uh, returns um, from that mimics kind of weekly returns um, of 100 stocks and three factors. And then the sample size are, um, we consider two, two, uh, two kinds of sample sizes. One is um, t equals 520, which represents 10 years of weekly return. And then another is t equals 1040, which represents 20 years of weekly returns. And we compare the portfolio risks and sharp ratios. So the uh, benchmark portfolios in this um, simulation uh, includes the plug-in mean variance uh, portfolio on factors, which is actually the optimal factor portfolio because factors are uh, low dimensional. And so here we're talking about three dimensional um, factor. So this 
plugin portfolio would be uh, already very good. And then three fund portfolio by Kan and Joe, and also mean variance uh, portfolio uh, with sample mean and sample covariance matrix plugged in. So that is MVP plugin um, portfolio. Uh, or um, the same sample mean, and then with um, all these uh, linear shrinkage or nonlinear shrinkage or nonlinear shrinkage with uh, adjusted for factor models um, as the um, inputs. Uh, they are called MVLS, MVNLS, MVNLSF. And then uh, also uh, one of the most recent model, DCCNLS, which um, actually um, incorporates um, time varying volatilities as well because it's dynamic conditional correlations. And uh, so uh, this is uh, what we use MVNSS, NLS to denote it. So uh, also the original maxer here. And then uh, Basically, the simulation result kind of uh, confirms our uh, theoretical um, um, findings. So indeed, max age does work very well. So these numbers are, uh, as I said, are calculated based on um, true values, true parameters. So we can actually know the risks and the true sharp ratios over 1,000 replications. And then over these 1,000 replications, we see, for example, a sharp ratio for each replication. And then we take an average for you know, ease of comparison and then together with a standard deviation. Um, so here, um, first of all, the, um, the sharp ratio of max age um, is indeed uh, the highest. And then when we go to, uh, when we go from a smaller sample size to a larger one, then we see um, improvements for all of these portfolios. And then the uh, sharp ratio will, for max will become uh, even higher. So the maximum sharp ratio in this simulation is uh, 1.66. And then um, max age when t equals 520, this is about 70% of the maximum sharp ratio. And then when t becomes larger, this case is about 80%. So that's the simulation studies. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, go to this more interesting empirical studies to see, um, you know, uh, really empirically how, how this works. Um, we uh, use, again, data from, uh, you know, SP500 and then Pharma French three factors. And then the risk constraint here is said to be uh, the risk of the uh, index for, I think, the very first um, training period, so it's 2%. And then um, well, uh, we use a rolling window scheme. Basically, uh, every half a year, we uh, can uh, uh, select the stock again, and then construct portfolios using past 10 years of returns. And this is, uh, we do a weekly rebalancing. Every week, we make sure that we are holding the same portfolios. This portfolio is going to hold for half a year. And then additional compared portfolios include the index and also equally weighted portfolios, which has been seen empirically to perform well. And also, uh, we also included in uh, this uh, empirical studies um, some additional mean variance portfolios, meaning that, um, so here we have the, um, uh, just a different mean vector as input. So this uh, one year momentum as the mean input has been, uh, I think, proposed in the recent paper. Um, this is C uh, nonlinear shrinkage by Angle, Lado, and Wolf. And then, uh, so uh, we also consider three portfolios with such mean vector. Uh, uh, we also include global minimum variance portfolios as well. So, uh, because global minimum virus portfolios have also been seen to perform, um, perform quite well empirically, so we include them in the comparison. So, we see from uh, this performance summary that, um, so again, in terms of sharp ratio, the uh, max age uh, does reach a high sharp ratio compared with uh, the, the benchmark portfolios. Uh, and also in terms of the risk, um, these MV portfolios, basically no matter with the sample mean as input or the momentum uh, mean as input, um, 
all uh, have a relatively higher mean, uh, sorry, higher risk uh, compared with the, uh, the risk level. And then um, max and max age have a risk that's close to the risk level. Um, um, and then, so uh, this uh, comparison has been done for a longer time period, 1980 to this year, as well as a shorter time period from the 2000 to this year. So basically the second panel, we also see similar comparisons. Um, so, uh, for example, the um, sharp ratio, um, other than maxes, we also see a sharp ratio, high sharp ratio of, of factor, and also here the um, mean variance DCC nonlinear shrinkage with momentum as the input, and so on and so forth. Um, so, for practical considerations, one may wonder what happens if we add transaction costs. So, uh, we, uh, in fact, in order to find out this, we, um, we did a very careful analysis with transaction costs considered, uh, taken, taken uh, into account. So, basically, we uh, take the um, uh, models from uh, the literature, um, these papers, to build the uh, models for the transaction costs. And then, uh, so uh, after tra transaction costs being considered, actually a short message is that um, maxer H, uh, the advantage of maxer or maxer H becomes even more clear. So uh, the reason is that actually, uh, as we have already seen, maxer and maxer H are sparse portfolios. So when they are sparse, then uh, they correspond to smaller turnovers. So uh, that correspond to small transaction costs. So, for example, if we compare maybe the, uh, for example, GMV, global minimum variance portfolios, does have uh, quite good, um, you know, sharp ratios uh, previously. However, after transaction costs are taken, uh, are taken into account, then um, the, the drop of sharp ratio is almost maybe 50%, 40-50% for all of these MV and GMV uh, estimators. And then um, uh, I think max and max age for the long time period, the job was uh, also around 20%. Uh, also, uh, well, uh, not so small, but uh, smaller than the others. And then uh, for the recent time period, the job was only 11 or 13% for the two uh, portfolios. So that highlights the advantage of using sparse portfolios. And another comparison that uh, we can have is this comparison between maxer H and the factors. So from the factors to maxer H, we, uh, we have seen uh, just now a uh, factor and idiosyncratic component separation. Uh, there basically, uh, this is optimal portfolio based on factors. And then here the maxer H actually has a higher sharp ratio compared with factors. That highlights you know, the additional sparse portfolio um, um, based on individual assets, um, you know, compared with factors, they basically gave us, um, you know, enhance the um, sharp ratio from factors alone. So uh, this is also an interesting uh, finding. So we hold portfolio that's optimal uh, portfolio based on factors as well as a few individual stocks. So that can give us quite a lot of um, gains from here. So, uh, well, uh, we come to the summary now. Uh, um, so uh, basically, uh, we started with um, um, uh, financial big data that has all these big data challenges uh, or financial data challenges, including including high dimensionality, high vitalness, hydroscedasticity, dependency, and so on. And then we created a white box, uh, Maxer H. This white box contains the following key ingredients: uh, unconstrained regression format and uh, robust statistical method to deal with the heavy tailed returns, and then a random matrix theory also extended for uh, the hydroscedastic case, and then uh, sparse regression. So these key elements put in together uh, will be able to give us a portfolio which. Um, uh, for uh, you know, whose risk is well controlled, and uh, returns are nearly maximized, and um, well, um, indeed, more importantly, it has theoretical guarantee to approach mean variance efficiency. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ying. That was great, and you're right on time. So that's perfect. So there are a couple of questions from the audience, but I think given this is uh, the transition to the discussion, I'm going to 
hang on to those and we'll come back to those in the Q&A session in a minute or well, in 10 minutes or so. So now uh, our discussant is Professor Michael Wolf. Michael, if you'd like to share uh, your screen. And Michael, I think you might still be on mute. There we go. How about this? Perfect. Good to go? All right, well, thank you for having me. I'll jump right in given the time constraints. And uh, I have a few comments on the model and then the empirical study. So we've seen the model of this form and there's this multiplier gamma t. And so what this implies that the conditional covariance matrix is just a multiple of a common underlying uh, sigma zero. But everything you know, moves together in tandem according to, uh, to gamma t or gamma t squared, which means that the conditional variances can change, but conditional correlations do not. And so a particular implication is that the max sharp ratio portfolio is constant over time, even conditionally. Whereas I think we, uh, we know from you know, experience that, for example, in, during times of crises, correlations tend to move up and you know, they're not constant. And that means that the maximum sharp ratio portfolio might well change over time. And especially maybe different in terms of crises compared to you know, times of good markets. And I think that the model cannot handle, whereas a multivariate gauge model uh, could capture this effect. So that's one comment on the model. Uh, comment on the portfolio selection. I think the, uh, that is a no, really a non-standard problem you're looking at because there is crucially, there's no constraint on the sum of the portfolio weights. And I think such a portfolio would not be useful to, uh, to most managers or maybe to, to all managers out there since it's customary for managers to be either fully invested. So the weights have to sum up to one or to be uh, zero invested or market neutral or dollar neutral. So the weights sum up to zero. But the portfolio that you have, you know, the weights can sum up to anything. And I think that would be a problem to people who actually have to invest money. In the beginning, you mentioned these firms out there who invest according to mean variance, and they have a sum of money to invest. And so they want to be probably fully invested. And then if the weights can be summed to anything, it's probably not useful to people. And in addition, people may have some uh, constraints on the gross exposure, like to be, they cannot go short, 100, zero, or maybe 130, 30, 160, 60. So all these things might be difficult to include in your model, but, but I don't know, but it hasn't been considered yet. Right? So I think it would be useful, at least as a robustness check, to consider these standard cases that are of most interest to portfolio managers. Another one that is non-standard is the, uh, the, um, the investment universe, which includes factors. And then what you get if you invest the exposure to uh, the factors were completely uncontrolled and could be anything according to your optimization output. Whereas if managers take factors into account, I would think most managers want to have a controlled factor exposure, oftentimes zero, right? It doesn't have to be zero, it could be something else. It could you know, change during times of crisis. They want more or less exposure to certain factors um, you know, like size, but you know, that in, again in your portfolio would not be possible because the exposure would be completely, uh, completely uncontrolled. So it would be at least as a robustness check, maybe the more interesting case would be uh, leaving out factors and or controlling for factors explicitly and not, not implicitly. Um, frequency, I was a bit surprised that you're using weekly data you know, why not use daily data at standard? It's out there, you have more data points. I think most 
managers would be interested in daily data, uh, not in weekly data, and that would be very easy uh, to do. The investment universe, so what you do at every investment date, which happens twice a year, you pick uh, 100 stocks at random. Right now, we have done this, I think, once or twice in the past. And if you repeat the exercise and you change the random seed in your you know, optimization routine, the outcomes can be rather different. Not only can the absolute numbers change for the different methods, even the ranking between methods can change. And I think that's not very satisfactory. It's not in the interest of reproducible research. Uh, also, it increases turnover going from one investment period to the other. But I think to be a more sort of unique, well-defined, and reproducible, why not take the 100 largest stocks? Not random stocks, but the 100 largest are well-defined. Random really makes the results random and not easy to check. Next, you consider the investment universe size of 100 stocks, right? But I think the, in addition, what should consider larger sizes such as 500 or 1,000, because then if you have a good method, you know, the larger is N, the better should be the out of sample sharp ratio of your method. So it would be useful to see whether indeed your performance goes up when N increases. And that's one thing, performance going up, but also, you know, managers out there, you know, oftentimes, and also in your talk, you said it's, it's nice to have a sparse portfolio only being invested in few stocks. It keeps turnover down. However, real life managers with a lot of money to invest is the last thing they want to have, a sparse portfolio, because the price impact is gigantic. If you have a billion dollars to invest and you're investing in five stocks, you know, the price impact is, is really going to go against you. So large scale managers want to be invested in, in a lot of stocks and not few stocks. So at least a thousand or more. So sparsity for them is actually a, a disadvantage and not an advantage. Next, the, uh, well, so here I, I look a bit stupid with this slide, but the slide is based on the paper I got to, to referee. And the paper I got to referee only had shrinkage methods for IID data. And it didn't have, as opposed to the talk, it did not have the DCC NL or the DCC NL combined with factors that, is, uh, that we have in addition, right? So now in the talk, you've done it in the paper, it wasn't in there. However, also what is what was done in the talk, right? You're plugging in on the one hand a shrinkage for the governance matrix, but then what you're plugging in, you're still plugging in the vector of sample means. And I think that is not fair. Because the vector of sample means is a very bad signal that's been known for a long time. And it is nothing that we have ever considered in our own work. So one should pick a good signal. There's a literature with 300, 400, 500 signals out there. I think pick any one that you like, but don't pick the sample means. So what we have done, it's very easy to implement is momentum. And that gives much better returns than the vector of sample means, right? And then uh, maybe you want to look at subperiods. Again, I said you're in your model, the maximum as our portfolio is constant over time, but things may change during crisis. So if you did like a rolling window exercise, and how does the relative performance of the methods you know, develop over time? Is it still the same during crisis versus good times? Or maybe there's a change in the ranking. It would be of interest, but right now we cannot say. Um, you only present like point estimates for sharp ratios, but maybe you want to test for statistical significance of the outperformance. And then if you do this, there are two things. Well, the one thing you have many, many different portfolios. So either you address a multiple comparison problem by using a multiple testing method, or you avoid it by just focusing on, you know, a couple of these many portfolios and do testing there. But I looked at your previous paper and there you did testing, but you, you used a bad test, the memo test, right? The memo test assumes IID normal data and it's really not valid. Uh, so you shouldn't use the memo test. So I can here shamelessly uh, advertise our own work, use the test by Ledour and Wolf. It works for heteroscedastic data, for dependent data. It doesn't need normality. So that one would be safe to use uh, coming to the end. Transactions costs. 
So what you did, you show how would in hindsight transaction costs have, you know, afflicted these portfolios unrestricted in the sense that they, they were not, they did not take any transaction costs into account. What people do in real life uh, at the portfolio construction stage, they limit turnover, right? They only allow for a certain amount of turnover taking transaction costs into account. And I think that that might change things. However, I also realize that everybody in the financial, you know, in the academic literature does it this way. And we have done it this way in the past as well. So this criticism, you know, I have to touch my own nose. Uh, summary, the model is impressive theoretical result of achieving optimality in a large dimensional setting. However, it does hinge on the assumption that the maximum sharp ratio portfolio does not change over time, even conditionally. And they, that may not be the case during crises. It may be a different portfolio than during you know, nice times. Uh, portfolio selection, I think at the very least, one should take into account a constraint on the sum of the weights to be fully invested, which is what most people have, to be zero invested, but some people have. But to not know what your you know, budget is, it's not useful to, uh, to managers, I would think. And then at least as a robustness check, we should take out factors from the investment universe, right? Empirical study, a very good backtest performance, favorable. Uh, the competitors, some of the competitors, I would think, were uh, you know, suboptimally chosen. In particular, I would, you know, I complained against the use of the, the vector of sample means as a signal. Uh, a better signal, like you know, momentum, I think, would make the numbers look better for some of the competitors. And then, as I mentioned, there are several robustness checks that one should look at, use daily data instead of weekly data. You have more data, more information, it's easy to, to do. Uh, look at larger universe sizes, 500, 1,000, maybe more, and potentially a, um, a sub-period analysis. And here a bit of self-promotion, some of our previous and forthcoming papers. So thank you, it's been an honor, a pleasure doing this, and thank you for having me. Thanks very much, Michael. That's great, and you're right on time as well. Okay, well, uh, Ying Ying, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, but maybe you'd like to to say something to some of the points raised by Michael, and then I can uh, call on people to ask their questions. Yes, well, uh, I, I'd like to say thank you so much, Michael, for the comments. You raised a lot of uh, comments. I um, wrote down a few, but uh, I'm not sure if I can address them all. Um, so I, in terms of sharp ratio, the conditional sharp ratio here uh, does change over time. And then uh, the test, yes, uh, we were thinking about that, but then uh, uh, here we have very high detailed um, uh, returns. So basically we require only two plus delta moment and your test, we did look into it, you, you require four plus delta moment. So, so, so far, uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely some uh, very interesting uh, questions. So we'll continue to work on it. Um, and that DCC um, momentum, yes, actually, uh, DCC, um, in fact, uh, we did uh, incorporate your momentum method. So um, uh, thank you for uh, pointing that out. But actually, um, yeah, I'm sorry that when I sent you the paper, it didn't include DCC. But when we uh, analyzed it uh, during this month, actually, we did use DCC with the momentum as the uh, mean, mean um, input. So that was done correctly. Um, and then a uh, large N, yes, uh, we can deal with daily data. Um, if when we deal with daily data, then the uh, sample size becomes larger, much larger. So uh, in that case, we can deal with much larger N as well. So it's true that currently we have a restriction, which is N must be smaller than P. So, uh, but because this work is designed for um, heteroscedastic returns, so indeed we can enlarge the um, sampling frequency, and that gave us, um, you know, more room to incorporate more stocks. So not only 100, um, um, but we should definitely try. We will try um, with much larger. And um, yeah, uh, 
Wow, I don't know if I write down everything. Uh, about uh, DCC uh, guard model, um, that's, that's actually a very good model. Uh, it's the only problem is that with high dimensionality, um, there's too many parameters to estimate. Um, but uh, yeah, indeed, we, we may uh, consider um, more in that direction. And then, um, so 100 largest stock, that's a very good suggestion. Thank you. So we should probably work on it. Um, it's good that this is still a work in progress. So we will take your suggestion seriously. So thank you again. Um, okay, well, um, I'm gonna abuse my position as chair to ask a question myself before I get the audience involved. I had a question about how your method could accommodate or not accommodate skewness. So you have an ellipticality assumption there. Is there anything you can do or can you talk a little bit about what breaks if uh, yeah. the distribution is asymmetric? Very good catch. Uh, so far, we all, we, uh, the distribution is symmetric and we only deal with the heavy tailness. When there's skewness, in fact, we thought a little about it already, but um, basically the, uh, the step where we use Huber regression, uh, we have to adjust that a little bit. Uh, so there the, the uh, coefficients can be estimated well. Um, yeah, so um, with some more complex work maybe that can be incorporated, we believe. I see, yeah, okay. All right, well, um, let me call on uh, Raymond Khan. He had a question uh, during the talk and I asked him patient and, and wait till now. So now um, let me um, uh, un unmute Raymond and you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, can you hear me, uh, Ying Ying? Yes. Raymond. Hi, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Uh, let me get to the question. Yeah, your variance uh, variance covariance matrix is changing over time. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you talk about risk target, when you talk about sharp ratio, are we talking about conditional moments? Uh, because, to, for example, when you say the portfolio has to meet the risk target, does it have to meet it period by period, or does it only have to meet it on an unconditional basis? So, uh, for this um, problem that we're working on, we're working on uh, unconditional moments. So, this is a long-term target. So, we want, okay. uh, in the long run, the variance is controlled and the return is okay. maximized. Because the reason why I ask this question is because if your moments are conditionally changing, uh, mm -hmm. The unconditional mean variance efficient portfolio is not the same equation as what you put up there. Uh, the reason is uh, there's a paper by Hansen and Richard dated very old days, and then there's another paper which gave the explicit formula for the uh, unconditional mean variance efficient portfolio that is due to Ferson and Siegel. And I think those two papers actually will tell you that if your conditional moments are changing over time, uh, you shouldn't be using. Uh, and conditional moments to do optimization. So that's the only thing that I, I want to communicate with you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay. So in the, uh, when we use conditional moments as the target, uh, then uh, for example, conditional uh, variance, then uh, the long run variance will exceed that, uh, uh, you know, uh, conditional if, if we use- the, I'll say, send you the reference. I'll send you the reference. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. I mean, uh, well, we, we target the long run. Or long -run. Thank you. Yes. Okay, we're in the rare position of having a couple minutes left and no, no questions. So let me give like 10 seconds for someone to, to raise their hand virtually. Hey, here we go. Uh, Rob Engel has a question. I will, um, Rob, you are ready to go. Well, I, I guess I'm, this is probably a, a question of my, unclear whether I understand it, but the, first step in your estimation is really estimating the sharp ratio and then you use that to construct the portfolio as I, as I, as I understand it. So the sharp ratio that you're reporting is based on, on a, a data set. Should we think about this as what you showed as an out of sample sharp ratio or is it kind of an in sample sharp ratio? So um, I guess we can say, uh, well, we are estimating uh, optimal. Uh, so it's a um, well, out of sample, in sample. Um, 
So we are estimating the optimal sharp ratio that can be obtained over the long run. Um, so indeed, in, in, if you talk about the numerical result, then everything in our report, uh, the reported results are out of sample. So uh, I'm sorry, Rob, I probably didn't understand your question, <laughs> I think. So uh, the numerical results are out of sample. So all the sharp ratios are evaluated based on the returns calculated from the portfolios that are already established. Okay, that's that was my question. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, and then in terms of estimating the target, it's, um, yeah, the optimal sharp ratio is something historical, yes. Okay, so if that's I the do. question, then it is out of sample. Well, that brings us exactly to the one hour mark. So let me say thank you to our speaker and discussant for a very interesting hour. I forgot to mention at the very beginning of the talk that we'll have an informal hangout session if people would like to stick around after we uh, stop recording. It'll be in about 30 seconds time. So uh, if you'd like to stick around for that. Uh, and let me finish by advertising the next Sophie seminar. Uh, next time we have an unusual seminar. It's gonna be a panel session with past presidents of the Society for Financial Econometrics. We're going to have Frank Diebold, Rob Engel, Ravi Jagannathan, and Eric Renaud talking about uh, financial econometrics and the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're going to uh, think about different issues related to, to crises and how it's going to impact our field. I'm really looking forward to that. That's in two weeks' time at the, at the usual time. Information on that will be on the seminar webpage, just like it is uh, normally. Okay, with that, um, we'll end the, the seminar. Thanks for coming and hopefully see you all in, in two weeks.